Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, a U.S. intelligence plan to build swarms of spy satellites. SpaceX is building a network of hundreds of spy satellites under a classified contract. Billionaire Elon Musk's company is becoming more involved with the U.S. government. So why are they doing it with Elon Musk? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. SpaceX is known for many things, including taking major steps towards a free market approach to the stars. Closer to Earth, it's known for Starlink, the satellite-based internet that has been used all over the world, including, controversially, in Ukraine. And the importance of satellites has even made its way to Hollywood. War simulation. We are going to test fire GoldenEye. Report your status. Two operational satellites, sir. Petya and the Misha, both in 90 minutes Earth orbit at 100 kilometers. Good. Here's the authorization code. Musk himself even has a cameo in the film Iron Man 2, chatting with superhero alter ego Tony Stark. Hey, those Merlin engines are fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, good idea for an electric jet. You do? Yeah. Then we'll make it work. There's another part of SpaceX that's less known to the public, Starshield. But it's been increasingly in the news. My name is Joey Roulette. I'm a space reporter for Reuters. Earlier this month, Joey and his colleague at Reuters, Marissa Taylor, broke some pretty big news about a Starshield project in the United States. What this is, is SpaceX is building a whole new constellation with hundreds of satellites that they're going to launch in orbit. And it's all done in secret for the National Reconnaissance Office. That's the government organization responsible for building U.S. intelligence satellites, also known as the NRO. We are the National Reconnaissance Office, collecting top secret imagery and signals from space. We see from the perspective of stars and push beyond to keep the world safe. You know, SpaceX is the largest satellite operator in the world. They have Starlink, which I think is about 5,500 satellites so far, which is more than any single company has or any country has for that matter. And so this is really the first other constellation that SpaceX is building that isn't Starlink. And no one has known about it. For a while, that included SpaceX employees themselves, according to Joey. So SpaceX, a few years ago, kind of quietly announced plans to have this Starshield business unit where it would basically be similar to Starlink, but for national security customers. And they weren't very clear on exactly what they would be doing. Employees within the company at the time weren't even really clear on how it would be segregated from the Starlink business. So there's been a lot of confusion on what Starshield really is and more confusion and uncertainty on what exactly they're working on. So I kind of set off to answer those questions, right? What would justify the the formation of this whole business unit, especially for SpaceX, which, you know, doesn't really like to make those moves unless they see a clear financial case and a, a good kind of payoff going forward. And that payoff was lucrative. The contract with the NRO is worth a reported $1.8 billion. We didn't know this was happening. It's being developed under this classified NRO program. It shows you know, the deepening ties that SpaceX has with the intelligence and national security apparatus. And it also shows an immense amount of trust that the U.S. government is putting into SpaceX, a company that has a controversial leader at times. We'll talk more about that controversial leader in a bit. But to understand the importance of that trust in Elon Musk, First, we have to understand the importance of this new satellite system. It's a system that's designed to significantly expand intelligence capabilities of the U.S. government, both for the military and its intelligence agencies, in a way that they haven't really approached before. And what's different about it is that the satellites in this new spy network are low orbit, much closer to the Earth than surveillance satellites usually are. 
the traditional way that governments used to spy from space were with big, expensive satellites in further orbits. And the further orbit in the Earth is usually a great place to put a satellite if you want to track a specific part of the Earth continuously, because the satellite can orbit with the Earth over that area and it never kind of lose track of it. But of course, the risks there is that it's expensive. It's a single satellite, so it could get struck by an enemy missile and it's far away, so you have to have a more robust sensor to be able to see further away with higher resolution. So now the trend is to put satellites in low Earth orbits um, where you get faster comms because it's physically closer to Earth and you can see things better because you're closer to Earth. When you're in a low Earth orbit, you're orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, so you're not having constant eyes on a particular spot on Earth. You can't float over an area of Earth continuously like you can in a further orbit. So that requires, you know, a user to launch hundreds of these things to kind of create a mesh network where if you have so many of those satellites, you can have that constant coverage over a particular target on Earth that you want to look at. So swarms of satellites like these would allow the U.S. to capture continuous images much closer than before. Joey says building a system like this was never really possible before because of the cost. And SpaceX has led the charge in bringing costs down. Putting hundreds of satellites in space has been an idea for decades, but no one has really been ever able to do it because launches were so expensive. SpaceX really drove the shift for lowering uh, launch costs. They were founded in 2002. They started working on a rocket called Falcon 1 and then later Falcon 9, which is their current flagship workhorse rocket. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Five, and that really changed everything in the space industry because it was reusable and they focused on bringing the rocket back after it launched the satellites to space. It forced the, you know, entrenched rocket makers to compete and lower their costs. It really gave opportunities to a lot of ideas that were kind of just collecting dust in the academic world for decades. Now that the costs have come down, spurred mainly by SpaceX's reusability trend, you know, it's creating all these new ideas for what people want to do in space. And that's been part of a trend of SpaceX's role in the industry throughout the company's rise over the past two decades. SpaceX came into the space industry over a decade ago as this newcomer that was trying to challenge all of the traditional established incumbents. SpaceX was really started with the goal of trying to make life multiplanetary. Or this was Elon Musk back in 2021. In, you know, in order to make life multiplanetary and become a space for civilization, in the truest sense of the word, the rocket technology must be improved dramatically. And they've grown immensely fast. And they're known for their speed in developing these complex space systems that otherwise would have taken a lot longer to build by other companies. So they've had this insurgent kind of rise in the space industry for the past decade. And now it's at a point where they are dominant in terms of launching satellites to space. They've kind of owned that market and they're sending humans to the moon for NASA two private citizens will take a trip to the moon. That is according to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is ready to blast off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and it's due to send two NASA astronauts into space, making the SpaceX rocket the first private rocket, first private company overall to launch humans into orbit. So NASA is depending heavily on SpaceX, and so is the Pentagon for launching national security satellites to space. So they've been growing and growing and growing in their dominance. And this is just another example of how they are in this kind of newer market where they're also trying to dominate as well. But as SpaceX builds a partnership with the U.S. military industrial complex, how will the U.S. strike a balance working with the company's controversial CEO? That's After the break.
We've heard a lot about the power of SpaceX to change the world and the space above it. Much of that rhetoric has come from the company's CEO, Elon Musk. He also owns the car company Tesla and the social media site X, formerly known as Twitter. At one point, the SpaceX CEO wrote, quote, between Tesla, Starlink, and Twitter, I may have more real-time global economic data in one head than anyone ever. And he's a polarizing figure. You uh, posted that pronouns and bio mean the woke mind virus ate your brain. Do you know what the term woke actually means? Um, it's come to mean a lot of things. Here are the top worst Elon Musk tweets. Come in, number one, which is Elon Musk saying that coronavirus is dumb. Come in, number two, he just says, pronouns suck. <laughs> if somebody's gonna try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go f- yourself. But go f- yourself. <laughs> is that clear? And those controversies mean Musk is sometimes at odds with the administration of U.S. President Joe Biden. But Joey Roulette from Reuters says how much these controversies affect the business is a topic of debate. I mean, there are some consequences that Elon's personality has had to his businesses. This particular contract with the National Reconnaissance Office was awarded in 2021, which was kind of before... Elon seemed to have taken this turn towards being more interested in the public discourse and having a voice on hot topics like politics and his views in the Biden administration and his views on the Ukraine war. Ukraine is losing people every day. And if if you're going to spend lives, it must be for a purpose and not just, you know, a mile here, a mile there. In fact, a mile back, the lines aren't moving. So just every day people die. For what purpose? So he kind of changed his public personality in the midst of this contract, I don't know if it would have changed the decision-making of the U.S. to award it if he had been like this from the beginning. But it has been awkward between SpaceX and the U.S. government. And when I talk to government officials about how they feel about Elon Musk, you know, you get half of the people are, are kind of like, yeah, this is a problem for us that we need to kind of strike a balance with and figure out how to work with it. And then the other half will just say, like, you know, well, we deal mainly with Gwen Shotwell, SpaceX's president, who is the more kind of operational leader of SpaceX while Elon does other things with his other companies. So, you know, there are concerns that the government has, that NASA has had, that the White House has had, and the Pentagon, of course, but they've been managing it. One example is the role that Musk and SpaceX have played in providing internet to the Ukrainian military through its Starlink satellites. The Ukrainian military relies on them. But last year, Musk said he once denied a Ukrainian request to activate a Starlink connection to a particular Ukrainian port because he felt it would aid a sneak attack on a Russian fleet. Musk wrote, If I had agreed to their request, then SpaceX would be explicitly complicit in a major act of war and conflict escalation. It really shows the clash in interests there, right? SpaceX got into Ukraine with Starlink mostly on its own dime, and that gave it control over how the the system was used. And I don't think the government, I don't think even SpaceX really realized how crucial Starlink would be for Ukraine's military. And it kind of raised alarms for everybody as soon as it started coming out that SpaceX was deciding where and how Starlink would be used. And this latest project, with the spy satellites, has also attracted an international response. Both China and Russia responded sharply to the news. A social media account run by the People's Liberation Army in China said the project exposed shamelessness and double standards on the part of the U.S., A spokesperson for the Russian government called it a legitimate target for retaliatory measures, including military ones. There's a whole space race going on. You know, we we talk a lot about it in terms of the moon, but of course, in terms of the militarization of space, there's a huge race going on too. Russia and China, of course, are the biggest other players in that race. And for issues like this, they feel that they need to come out with statements and respond to these emerging capabilities of the U.S. But in large part, they're not fully innocent either. The U.S. has accused China of of developing similar systems 
and not just surveillance systems in space, but weapons. And that's not to say the U.S. isn't interested in those technologies and weapons either. We just don't know as much about them. But, you know, we're all in this kind of arms race in space right now. And, you know, what China says is egregious. They're largely kind of developing the same thing as well. Russia's space program is not as savvy or equipped to develop these types of vast systems, but they've kind of looked more toward the weaponization of space. Russia carried out a missile test firing an anti-satellite missile into space, obliterating one of its own satellites and creating a vast debris field that's now orbiting Earth. And it's a space race that's in large part being carried out away from the public eye. The NRO-SpaceX partnership was a secret for three years. And Joey still hasn't gotten a response from SpaceX about it. SpaceX doesn't make it a practice to talk to reporters. They didn't respond to our request for comment for the particular story we had on their Starshield network. But Joey says he's not surprised at how secretive things are. I mean, there's a lot that we don't know in space, and there's a lot of things that are classified in, in in the U.S. government. It's especially so for space, though. Space is this very sensitive, emerging strategic domain that the government's kind of obsessed with now. And, you know, Russia and China are obsessed with it, too. And every day we learn of a new thing that is dependent on some kind of space technology. So the stakes are high. It's kind of the cliche domain of secrecy, right? Like the government's hiding UFOs and and evidence of UFOs and stuff like that. Not to say that's what they're hiding, but like, you know, it's not really surprising to me, at least, that there's a lot we don't know about what they're doing in space. But the more the technology advances, the more Joey thinks the secretive nature of the space industry is bound to change. The government says, you know, yeah, we kind of do keep things too secret and maybe we could be a little more open. I haven't really seen them making concrete moves in that direction, but I, in a way, think that's inevitable, especially thanks to these massive surveillance systems that are under development, right? I think this has the potential to change international relations going forward, because if you can truly see everything, I had one of my sources in the story say, no one can hide. And, you know, they were kind of really referring to China can't hide, for example. But if China's developing the same thing, the U.S. can't really hide either. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Ashish Malhotra and Chloe K. Lee. Was Siri Al Khalili, Amy Walters, Nagin Oliayi, Khalid Sultan, Miranda Lynn, David Enders, Sonia Bagat, Zaina Badr, Theranisa Kampana, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Joe Plord mixed this episode. Alexandra Locke is the Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>